guys ready? My name is Rebecca Dar. I'm with the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program, which is one of 26 policy programs, and we're actually based in New York City. Um, it is my pleasure this afternoon to welcome this panel on managing the Amazon, which is going to focus on preserving the basic biological functions of the Amazon. And with that, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this panel, which is Mr. Andy Revkin. He is the blogger for Dot Earth author and a fellow at the PACE Academy for Applied Environmental Studies. Thank you. Great. It's good to be here. Thanks for uh, stopping by. Um, and we're going to explore a place um, that's, that for most people on the planet, including most people in Brazil, is still largely a place of the imagination. It's kind of to me, and when I wrote The Burning Season, my book about the murder of Chico Mendes, the, the Brazilian activist in rainforest, um, resident and organizer, labor organizer, back in 1988, 89, 90. Um, I, I, did, I compare the Amazon to Alaska. It's basically a tropical Alaska. And for Brazil, it's kind of like what Alaska is for the United States. A distant frontier, a resource-rich place. But again, for most people, you're never going to actually be there. So, uh, so it either doesn't matter at all or, or, or not. And now, uh, here we are 20 years after I first became familiar with this place. There's still this, the stories are still the same. It's extraordinary, as you'll see in a minute, uh, you'll see some imagery. It's a sprawling, unbelievably diverse and, and untamed still largely um, biological uh, paradise. And it spreads over an area that I think, if I remember correctly from my own book, is the equivalent of the United States east of the Rocky Mountains. And it's a, that is all this, this great chunk of forest and rivers called the Amazon Basin. Um, there are a bunch of countries there. Brazil is a big chunk of the Amazon, and you'll hear in a minute from Fabiano Scarano, who's a biologist and ecologist for the Conservation International Group, which is led and was created by Peter Seligman here, the CEO, 24 years ago. And um, the, the theme here is managing the Amazon, which sounds kind of weird, you know, if, if it's such a sprawling place and still 80% or so is still fundamentally uh, not really developed heavily, then why do we have to think about it in those terms. But we live on a planet, as I've been writing in the New York Times on, uh, and, and on my blog there for a long time, Earth increasingly, in these next few decades particularly, is, in, is going to be what we choose to make of it. Um, we don't have the luxury anymore of living that kind of naive existence where we just kind of chop down the local forest or fish the fish in our local stream. And, and um, science has made us uh, vividly aware that um, we are now tweaking knobs on the way the planet works in ways that we, w not only that didn't happen until fairly recently, at least in a big way, but also that we weren't aware of. But the issue now is science, the scientists, as I've written off and on, they're kind of like um, the father talking to the wayward teenage son. Society is the teenager, you know, we've been in this resource uh, exploitive, uh, pubescent kind of approach to the world for, for all these centuries. And now the scientists are saying, well, son, if you don't change your ways, uh, bad things are going to happen. So how do we move in places like the Amazon, in places like the Gulf of Mexico, um, and in the global atmosphere? How do we move to a more managerial role with these resources that we've taken for granted for so long? And the Amazon is a really good kind of a, a, a place to look at, at how that's already been playing out, uh, because these battles have been waged there now for decades on how to manage, how to balance rights and responsibilities. So we're going to start. Fabiano, I think you brought some slides or, or some imagery to show us to remind people what this place is like. And it, right. I mean, there's certain aspects of it that you'll never know until you're there. <laughs> like, like when you're running down a, a, a path behind a rubber tapper um, who's dancing through the forest with the greatest of ease, and you're tripping and falling, carrying your cameras and stuff, and you suddenly reach for a tree to avoid falling down, and it turns out to be an astrocarium palm which has studded with, with needles this big, and you see them going through your fingers and going, oh my god, this happened to me 20 years ago. Uh, but, so you won't get that experience, but take us on a little tour. OK. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I'd like to first thank the, the organizers for this opportunity to come here and talk to you a little bit about our Amazon and our country. It's been a long trip from Rio to Aspen, but uh, it's all worth it. It's a fantastic festival and a very lovely place that you get here. Thanks, Andrew, for the invitation, and Peter for this opportunity, too. 
So uh, first to set the stage, we'd like to show you a few slides about the Amazon to give an idea of the size of the region and what's been going on there for the past years. So that's a picture of Brazil, and the country has an immense natural capital, 10% of the species of the world, 14% of the renewable fresh water of the world, and huge carbon stocks. The Amazon region, my map doesn't quite show it, but it's 60% of the Brazilian territory, and Brazil is the fifth largest country in the world, so that shows you how big only the Brazilian Amazon is. However, uh, deforestation has taken place largely in the country, and a little bit around half of our territory has now been outed by men. The Atlantic Forest, the most threatened biome, that's by the coast, 85% uh, of it's now gone, and 50% of the Cerrado, which is the central Brazilian savannas. But the Amazon is still pretty much well protected, as you are soon going to see. So to give you an idea of the conservation status of the region, that's a picture showing that the Amazon spreads well out to Brazil. The Amazon as a whole, 60% of it is inside Brazil, but you find parts of the Amazon region in other nine countries of, uh, of South America. And in most of them, CI works or has been doing work in the, in, in the past. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, and as I said, it's 60% of the Amazon as a whole. And, Amazon, and the Brazilian Amazon alone is home for 10% of the species of the world. Uh, luckily, nearly half percent, uh, uh, nearly 50% of the, of the Brazilian Amazon is now within protected areas, which is the dark green color that you get there. 15% uh, per, uh, has been deforested, and nearly 40% uh, is, uh, is to un unprotected forest areas. The deforested areas, as you can see, is all in red. So I'd like to show you a little bit the importance of these protected areas in the region as a whole. I'll give you an example of an important mining area where Brazil produces lots of iron called Carajás, that's in the state of Pará, in the eastern part of the Amazon. Uh, this dark green color there and the pink one, these are all protected areas that have been created around the mining area in the, in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, that was instrumental to protect, as you can see, a large chunk of the Amazon region. Now in 2007, most of the area surrounding it has already been deforested. So these protected areas, they actually prevent the, the expansion of, of, of deforestation a great deal. And uh, I'd like to have a pointer now to show you where that previous slide uh, was. It's a, a small green part surrounded by red towards the east in the Amazon. So the, the large chunk in dark green uh, west of that part prevented deforestation going inwards. And that's why we still have uh, nearly 80%, 85% of, of the Brazilian Amazon is, is still uh, in, in good conditions. So that's an example going beyond the Brazilian border uh, within what we call the Guiana Shield. The Guiana Shield gets a part of Brazil, the northern part of the state of Pará and the state of Amapá, and also these three countries that you get there, Guiana, Suriname, and French Guiana. In, in 2002, that's how it looked in terms of, of protected areas. That's the dark green there again. 2006, May, December 2006, and very soon it's going to be looking like that. That's a nice uh, thing to see in comparison to the red, the expanding red. It is zone. good, isn't it? And uh, well, I'm proud to say that it has to do a lot with the work Conservation International has done in the countries with local governments and with federal governments as a whole, in all these countries, actually. So we often get asked by different sectors of, of society and also by the Brazilian government, what are protected areas worth? Uh, I hope you can see these numbers there, but in the 
the, in the second line in this table that I have, well, the light green color in the Brazilian map is only the protected areas where Conservation International has been working historically. That's only a fraction of all the protected areas we get in the country. But we decided to calculate how much this effort of our organization means in terms of carbon and in terms of water. The area protected with the help of CI within the Brazilian Amazon uh, represents 16.8 billion tons of carbon, which uh, $10 per ton of carbon, that means around $168 billion worth of carbon alone, uh, only inside the areas that Conservation International worked, which as I said before, is not the whole of the Amazon, of course. And the population that benefits from the water protected within these areas adds up to 3.5 million people, which is uh, a, a very considerable proportion of the amount of people that live in the Amazon region. That's about 20% of the Amazon population as a whole. So that shows, in terms of, uh, of more precise numbers, what are these areas worth if we are not at all concerned with the species that live there. So you may have heard that during last, the last summit of, of the Climate Convention in Copenhagen, the Brazilian government, namely President Lula, he stood out and committed to reduce Amazon deforestation in 80% by 2020. Uh, so we calculated what this means in terms of, of carbon that we are going to be preventing to uh, uh, emission in the country, uh, which is about 15 billion tons of carbon that are not going to be emitted because deforestation is going to be halted as much, and that's worth $150 billion approximately. So this is our vision for the future in Conservation International in terms of how to maintain the Amazon sustainable. And you see there are these three different types of lands there. There are the protected areas, unprotected forests, and the areas that have already been altered. So protected areas should be used for conservation, but also for sustainable use. Our previous uh, Minister for Environment, Mrs. Marina Silva, whom I had the privilege to work under her command, for a couple of years while I was in the Ministry of Environment, Marina Silva uh, has created 35% of the protected areas of the world in the past six years. So that's pretty much significant. She left yeah. the government two years ago. She wasn't very happy the way things were going. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, she's also running for president. Right? She's running for president now. So she and left. she's a daughter of rubber tappers as well. That's right. She's a daughter of the Amazon. She's from Acre State. She first got contact with writing and reading at the age of 16 because she wanted to become a nun. Uh, she didn't become a nun. She has a large family, many kids. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, she left office about two years now. And now she's running for, for presidency. And her uh, running for president. Her running for president has really affected the way Lula behaves. For sure. So his commitment to protection of, and reducing deforestation is stimulated by Very much her so. decision to run for president. It was nice to see in Copenhagen that all the other presidential candidates, they showed up, and all of them were talking about environment so much. Uh, pretty much influenced by, 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 by her competition is a good thing. And uh, well, the nice piece of work she did, I, I find, is that these protected areas in Brazil, she created a, a lot of sustainable protected areas, areas where people that live inside or, or in the neighboring parts of these areas, they, they can actually try to make a living out of it. And that has been instrumental to the economic development of the state of Acre, for instance, in the western part of the Amazon. So we think protected areas should still continue being used for conservation, but also for sustainable use. Outer areas is where we should focus on intensive use, agriculture, forestry, mining, all that's going to be important for the development of the region. Uh, and of course, we would love to see that taking place in areas that have already been altered. Altered areas through forest restoration can become unprotected forests as well. And these unprotected forests with Good forest management, they can help the country build an economy uh, based on natural forest products and wood, 
without damaging the nature. And that's this big scenario there is what we like to call green economy. And that's what pretty much CI is trying to support Brazilian government and corporate sector to build that in the Amazon region, in Brazil and in the other countries where we work as well. That's a great introduction. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Now, Peter, uh, maybe you could uh, dig in a little bit on this question of the carbon value. Um, if also just get, get, remind people of how you got to be what you're doing and a very quick sketch of your, uh, why my, you're doing my this. My life history. Well, no, <laughs> not so much the life history, but just your focus and why CI is focused on the Amazon particularly okay. and, and, and okay. among other places. Um, I grew up in the Rocky Mountains and uh, studied forestry. So that's where my love of the outdoors came from. And I really got involved in, uh, in conservation, working for uh, the Nature Conservancy, and started their international program. And then felt that if conservation was going to work, it had to focus on creating livelihood for people. And uh, uh, out of that created CI in 1987. Um, and uh, the, actually the first things we did were work in the Bolivian Amazon, where we began to acquire Bolivian debt at 10 cents in the dollar, and then went back to the government and said, we have your debt portfolio, we'll trade a debt portfolio for the creation of protected areas. The Bolivian government said, how much do you want? We'll do it. And, uh, and then we began thinking about how to actually create jobs. And, and so the concept was, let's create jobs so people can thrive through conservation. What has happened uh, in the past 23 years has been enormous success in the protection of critically important biodiversity hotspots, and we're really pleased with that. But in that same 23-year history, the rate of extinctions around the world has gone up dramatically. The destruction of marine resources has gone up dramatically, and we've had systemic threats to just the health of the <laughs> of the planet and to people through climate change, et cetera. So what we've actually done this year is changed our entire institution's mission from protecting biodiversity to supporting human well-being by maintaining and restoring ecosystems yeah. that give essential services to people. And so when you look at something like the Amazon, which is not only important for Brazil, but also has an enormous value uh, in terms of water vapor and natural resources and biodiversity for the planet, uh, you actually can only do this if you look at it um, um, from the, the benefits and the services. Yeah. One of them is carbon, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, just touching on the carbon issue for a second, um, Fabio has already talked about the huge carbon stocks. The reason that's important is that somewhere between 18 and 20% of all the CO2 that's emitted into the atmosphere each year that causes climate change, let's say 20% of it, comes from the burning of forests. That's twice all the emissions that come from the entire transportation sector globally. So if you don't deal with deforestation, we lose. We have to deal with deforestation. And so all the work on renewable energy is essential. On changing the grid, essential. If we do that and we don't deal with deforestation, we are really wasting our time. We need to make certain that our portfolio includes that. The challenge then becomes how do you deal with a nation yeah. that looks at its resources as, these are mine, I'm going to do what I want with them, don't tell me what to do. And that's been the legitimate approach of Brazil, Indonesia, the Congo, et cetera, for years. And now we're saying, come to the table and please change what you do. And their response is, well, look what you've done. Yeah. So I heard that many times when I was right. running around in Brazil. That's the importance of looking at the value of carbon. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, the states of Amazonas, Pará, Amapá, these massive forested states, see that they have an asset, which is the carbon, in their trees. And if we're willing to buy that asset, they make more money than if they log it. Yeah. And so what's happened is that these states have gone to their president and said, we like the sovereignty issue, but we actually want to develop. Let's protect the forest. And that's what committed, convinced President Lula that it was time to change his approach and really look at a commitment to reducing emissions. And now what we're involved in is the whole challenge of how do you build a market yeah. and how do you create a market, not only for the carbon, this is the first step, but the water stock, yeah. which is enormously valuable 
and how do we do that too? Um, so you're, it sounds like you're telling me that when I was there in the late 80s, early 90s, spending months, uh, that was the time when Amazonino Mendez, the, the governor of the state of Amazonas, was giving away chainsaws in return for votes. But are you saying this is basically not happening anymore? Amazonino is still around, but he's, is he? uh, he's almost green now. If you talk to him, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> and the urbanization. I, I wanted to ask you about urbanization generally in Brazil. There, there are several demographic trends in, that makes, I assume makes it favorable for Brazil to start to be more enthusiastic about preserving forests. One, one is they have a very low fertility rate. Brazil is, uh, I think, below one and a half children per woman now. And, mm -hmm. and also there's this urbanization trend that you see around the world. Uh, Manaus. When I was there, it was a city of a million, I think, already. I don't know what yeah, it's up it's, to now. It's, it's a very good example. Manaus is two and a half million now. It's yeah. doubled, more than doubled, actually, from those days. And Manaus uh, has uh, the largest region in the country, it, it, it is the largest center for production of technological apparatus of all sorts, computer stuff and uh, TVs and all that. Uh, and that turns the Amazonas state the fourth GDP in Brazil. So they, they are ahead of them in São Paulo, Rio, and Minas Gerais, so the, the, the three largest ones. Uh, and it, it, it's beginning to look like an interesting model because you have a, a state like that that took only, it, it's the largest state in the country, it's very big. It has it's the only, largest state in the world. In the world, it's yeah. the largest state in the world, that's right. <laughs> Actually. And it has only one small area, which is Manaus, yeah. where there's all this activity going, producing lots of richness. Now, there are two things to be solved there. One, that Manaus has to be more sustainable than it is nowadays, and the quality of, of life has to improve. And this richness that's, that is produced in, the, in this technological center, that has to be better distributed throughout the state and, and the region as a whole. But it's an interesting model that shows that uh, fast development, high-tech development, can live surrounded by protected areas like we have in the state. Amazonas is one of the states with the highest proportions of protected areas in the, in the whole region. Fascinating. Now, I have a question for both of you that, that sort of pulls out from the Amazon globally to other areas that are like it. Um, one of the key uh, gaps there when I was there, again, uh, after the murder of Chico Mendez, mm -hmm. uh, which was done with pretty much impunity, uh, actually, the, the sense of impunity about killing people over land kind of ended with his death. There's still been murders, uh, yeah. the, the nuns and yeah. others who've been yeah. murdered since then, but at a much smaller rate. Um, does the advance of governance um, in areas like Brazil, um, how, how important a role is that? And then when you look qu quickly around the world at uh, Borneo, let's say, where, how far behind the, where things are in the Amazon now are places that also matter greatly for forest resources elsewhere? You talk Any about Brazil, thoughts? I'll talk about the uh, rest yeah, of the world. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I will only say good things, but, <laughs> but then you correct me if I'm wrong. I think, I think that governance is the, is the main issue there. And it, it, it has improved a great deal during the past 20 years. And that was a, a combination of efforts from third sector, government, corporate sector as well. And they are large. Well, just to give you an example, our latest achievement with our negotiations with uh, the government of Amazonas. The gov this one that is, has the fourth GDP in the country, it's quite a lot of money that they're producing. They, they decided to commit, and they stated that in a, in a letter that's focusing on Nagoya, the biodiversity convention that's going to be held in October. And in this letter, they state several good things about nature and how they're going to commit to protect and to, to create more protected areas. But the main issue there is that they're committing 1% of the GDP to research, creation of new protected areas and hiring permanent personnel to work within these areas. That's a measure of governance. That, and that amounts to 10 times more than what the state's currently investing. So that's about shows, $300 million a year. That's right, $300 million a year for research and for conservation initiatives. So, so and again, this sounds like Brazil already represents what you would say is a success story yeah. from which elements could be applied elsewhere? Is that, is that fair to say at this point, or it's still too early? No, it is. It is. Brazil is exporting intellectual resources to deal with global environmental issues. They are way ahead. They are, it's a, the University of Minas Gerais is, is extraordinary, and, and 
the, just the way they're looking at payment for ecosystem services. Um, in Rio now, uh, the concept of a user is a beneficiary of upstream water, pays a fee, so the upstream landowner gets compensated for taking care of the ecosystem. And, and those are really important breakthroughs. And what happens in Brazil is, is really impacting and leading what happens throughout South America, but they are way ahead. Um, other parts, they did lose, though, in the World Cup. I should point that out. Um, uh, yeah. We're talking devastation. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Devastation. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had to say something bad about it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you look actually at the senior management of CI, a lot of them are Brazilians. So, yeah. so it's, there's a lot of tension around the World Cup. Um, so, uh, but if you look at other parts of the world, um, there's a long way to go. Um, I would say that you know, we do a lot of work in Indonesia, and Indonesia is a very, very tough place to work. Yeah. Um, uh, there is a increasing decentralization in the forested states, whether it's uh, Borneo or Aceh or, or in Papua, and the power of the Mupati or the governors is actually increasing, and so we're having much more success dealing at the government, at the, at the state level than at the federal level. Yeah. Um, and there's just well, a culture like there. 20,000 islands are Yeah, well. and so that's really been an important step forward. Um, in the Congo, um, uh, we have just done an important transaction, voluntary transaction with Disney to protect forests, and they're voluntarily offsetting their emissions. Um, and so there are pockets of success there. It's a really challenging place because it's resource-rich and poorly governed. Yeah. Uh, Rwanda, different case, real important turnaround and success there. So nation by nation, it's different, but uh, Brazil stands out as the success story. And what are the, what are the looming issues for, for the Amazon? Uh, there's a perpetual dream. It's actually slowly becoming not just a dream, the concrete, the road to the Pacific, roads to the Pacific. Right. And then you start to talk about significant Asian commerce, uh, agricultural out export, um, which has always been, every Amazonian governor has always seen this as one thing. And just China generally, the influence of China within the Amazon. And then oil, not so much in Brazil, but just over the border in Yasuni, which I recently wrote about is a, a new paper determined this one little area um, um, is the, maybe the most biodiverse spot in yeah. all of Amazonia, or actually the world. And it's also one of the richest oil deposits. Yeah. So it reminds me of the situation in the Gulf of Mexico where you have uh, this great asset uh, that has two different sets of values attached to it. Uh, so among the various things happening in the Amazon now, do you have your own sense of the biggest concern? Well, yeah, there are at least three big ones, I'd say. Two, two more immediate and one more in the long run. The more immediate ones are related to the construction of a very large dam. It's actually the third or fourth in the world called Belo Monte. That's in the Xingu region, which is the, in the western part of the Amazon. Uh, CI has just produced a paper showing that nine fish species are going to go extinct. It's an area where many indigenous nations live, actually 20 of them. Uh, water is sacred for them. It's like for us, we have the image of, of heaven as, as the sky. For them, heaven is in the water. So if you mess with the water, they, they, they really don't like it. And, and, and even worse than that, that this dam is not going to be very productive. It's being made at the Xingu River, and that river stays half of the year with very little water. So th this dam is going to work for half time only. And transmission to the main centers that need the energy is very inefficient. It's a very long way to transmit this energy. So uh, we are 100% against it. Uh, it also happens that on our board of directors, there's a man by the name of Megaron, and Megaron is the paramount chief of the Kayapo people. So we've really been engaged in that area for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's... It will be an amazing. It will be a terrible uh, decision if it's if it's yeah, if it's, it's built. A, so we're fighting it hard. It's an 18 million dollar, 18, 18 million, million, uh, billion dollar billion, investment, yeah. and wow. uh, we had never in the country invested a quarter of that in 
science and, tech, uh, and technology focusing yeah. on other types of, of energy generation. So it's a pity. So Belo Monte is a, is yeah. a top big issue. And there's one that's about to be voted in Congress, which regards our forest code. That's a very good code, oh, right. a very good law that was uh, uh, created 40 years ago. And uh, well, it says many good things, but the best thing about it, in my opinion, is that every property in the Amazon has to maintain 80% of its area, 80% 80 intact. So this, uh, the people from the agricultural sector are, try, are trying to bring this down and reduce this, this proportion to 50%. There's a big resistance in the country from uh, NGOs and uh, inside the government as well, Marina Silva's group, and also from parts of the corporate sector. And I think we may win this battle, but Belo, uh, Belo Monte, I'm not as optimist. And, and the third thing is the building of highways. And uh, of course, this, there are many plans for roads to the Pacific, roads to, to the Caribbean. And they do agree that they are very important for the country economy. In CI, we are beginning to do an experiment now, again, with the government of the state of Amazonas on, on a road that connects two, two cities within the Brazilian Amazon. The city of Manaus that I already mentioned and the city of Porto Velho in the Rondonia state. This is a 1,000 kilometer uh, highway uh, that's about to be built. But the government of Amazonas had this vision and they created protected areas all around the road beforehand. So now they're hiring us to bring governance to these protected areas and try to make living to people that live in these areas so that we don't have the typical pattern of a fish bone scar in right. the middle of the forest. So what I think is that we can build such roads as parkways. And uh, they are going to uh, increase the standard of living in the regions, going to produce more wealth in the country, and that's not going to be at the expense of our natural resources. And that's an interesting notion, the parkway. It, well, the Palisades Parkway leading from New York City up the river on the west side the Hudson is an example of mm -hmm. that kind of, that maintained in the face of extraordinary sprawl around New York City, a great green uh, corridor. So it's certainly mm -hmm. a good model. The, the, other, the other big threat which is ongoing is the expansion of the soy and the, the agricultural frontier that is, is pushing into the Amazon. And uh, that's fueled a lot by a demand for fuel. And so we're, we've seen a tremendous destruction of the Sahado, as well as a, a destruction of the Amazon. And I think we, it's now 15% has been cleared. Uh, the work that we're seeing in terms of the science is that if the Amazon is cleared to 30%, if 30% of the original state of the Amazon is cleared, there'll be a radical shift in the hydrology. And of course, that will impact agricultural productivity in, in Brazil, but it also has an enormous impact because of, of water cycling uh, in the United States and in, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but what has been fascinating as we've begun to talk to partners about how do you address that, and uh, we have created an alliance that I'm really pleased to see come together, and it's actually been led by, of all organizations, Walmart, who has uh, committed, looking at the sustainability of their supply chain, and a concern for the security of that, to uh, uh, not selling any products in Brazil that in any way contribute to deforestation. And they brought in Cargill and Bungie and other institutions to partner with it to see whether you could actually begin to use the private sector as a, as a vehicle for impacting and influencing uh, uh, some of these policies. And the challenge is monitoring and tracking that, but yeah. there's also a real intensive effort to develop that capability too. So, so Right now, what we're seeing more than ever before is an understanding and an awareness of the issue, and we're actually seeing uh, responsiveness in government to actually trying to get their arms around this. Yeah. In a minute or two, we're going to move to questions from the audience, and I think we're going to have roving microphones, so you just wave and say who you are and ask a brief question. Um, it, it, back, back in the late 80s, the other thing that was really, uh, well, until fairly recently, a hot issue is uh, what are the things consumers here should be wary of doing in terms of wood products and, other, and that kind of thing that could relate to um, extraction in places like the Amazon. Is that still as much an issue or is this increasingly becoming an issue of things like soy and fundamentals like iron and uh, you know, Asian demand for basic resources? Or is it still, does the consumer question still matter? 
I think consumer choice is really important because consumer choice is an action that leads to awareness and, and, a, and an engagement, and that is absolutely essential because the public, our public, the global public, has got to understand that protecting nature is actually about humanity, not about nature. And so those choices are really, really important. If you look at the mega impacts that we're seeing, um, it's the real hunger for food and fuel, and that's what's driving this. And so we need to come up with some smart solutions um, and new technologies as well. So again, concentrated agriculture on, on lands that were already degraded, that kind of thing. Right? Absolutely. There's a huge potential to restore and put agriculture on degraded lands, and, and that's good for, I mean, carbon capture as well as food production. Yeah. One, one point, we can't uh, not talk about climate science. Uh, you're you're going to be on the, the next panel, the fifth assessment report, right, as one That's of the right. authors for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which got under a lot of pressure the last year for some lapses here and there. There was this brief burst of discussion of Amazon Gate, uh, which, of course, didn't hold up. But, but the science overall seems to show, at least as the stuff I've written about, that if you limit fragmentation of the Amazon, it has a high level of resilience to yeah. retaining its moisture and all that stuff. Is that, is that your reading of the science right now? Yeah, that's true. Uh, um, in, other, in other words, if you, it, it insulates it from that general, just the warming as something that could convert it to some new kind of ecosystem or whatever. Yeah. Uh, climate change is a, is a world problem. There's, there's no way around that. And uh, we are already undergoing it. So as much as we mitigate, uh, we are going to be suffering changes. And of course, many of them are already going on. My city, Rio, is a city that rains all year round. What's been happening in the past five years is that it rains everything in the summer, doesn't rain at all in the winter. The meaning of that is that the rainfalls in the summer, since people, there's a lot of people that live in poor conditions in the mountains, there are lots of hill slides. And you are probably seeing that even on TV here every day that uh, people, people die, you know? So we are already feeling that. And if we stop all deforestation now, and, and if we halt all carbon emission right now, we are still going to be suffering it for the next few years. But it's important that we do these changes now in order to try to adapt. Along with that, areas such as the Atlantic Forest, we are on an initiative now that CI is leading along with many other organizations and also the corporate sector and, the, and public government to try to double the area of Atlantic forest that's currently there by planting forests. And with forest plantation, we can help equilibrate that a little bit more. The oceans also help uh, equilibrate very much. And again, all the oil exploration and all the problems that we are seeing now in the Gulf of Mexico, that has to be somehow circumvented. And investment on high technology for that in order to be able to produce oil, but at the same time preserve these areas is essential. So. Uh, as long as the Amazon is well preserved, we, we have to bear in mind that we have to do similar efforts in other parts of the world. CI is trying to lead in the negotiations in Nagoya for us to establish a target for 2020 of having 30% of the world's surface protected. It's going to be very difficult for us to achieve that, uh, but Brazilian government's already committing to 15%, 1.5, which is already a big step. We have less than 10% these days. Uh, so it, it has to be a worldwide effort. Of course, there's a lot of pressure in the Amazon. We, we, we like to maintain this pressure there. We think that it is important, as Peter mentioned, to, to, to the whole atmospheric circulation in the world, but it's not the Amazon alone. All countries are going to have to make a huge effort uh, to do their share. But again, I think you presented a pretty strong picture that the Amazon gives a, a kind of a model for ways to move forward uh, globally with these issues that will face the balancing resources and, and maintaining vital ecosystems. So now it is time for questions. Way in the back, and then the next person there, and then I'll try over here. Yeah, hi. I'm John Negroponte. Uh, Peter, I just want to be sure I understood what you were saying about the responsibility for carbon emissions. I think you said 20% of the global emissions come from tropical forests, is that correct? I said between 18 and 20. Okay, and so then you suggested putting a price on that. And I take it you're implying that the international community or through some mechanism, we would pay countries that have tropical forests, uh, Brazil, the Congo, the DRC, and Indonesia uh, to 
not destroy them and the communities not to destroy them. So what do you visualize as the, I mean, which sounds like a very interesting idea. What, what are the mechanisms you visualize for accomplishing that? Well, there is already a price on carbon and a limit on carbon emissions that's been established in European countries, in the EU. And so um, carbon is already, carbon has a value. What was excluded in the Kyoto Protocol, which is the regulatory uh, framework that established this value, was uh, the carbon that is, is captured in standing forests. And so what is going on right now and actually has been agreed upon in Copenhagen is that reducing emissions from deforestation needs to be a part of the next global treaty and so you end up with a value placed on the carbon that is left standing in the trees. So that mechanism has to be passed. So right now there's a very intense conversation in the United States, right, as to climate change and, and uh, re how do we get to our targets. Um, I think that there has to be a price on carbon. I think that, that it's an asset that's tradable and we need to have a price on it. Uh, what is being discussed right now is how do you make that politically feasible? And of course, that's the big challenge because no one wants a tax. Um, and and there's, uh, so there's that conversation about is cap and trade a tax? Is there just a tax? How do you make it revenue neutral? That is really an important conversation right now. What's really interesting is that the utility companies and many companies really want predictability in their future. And they say, we've been listening to a discussion about this for a long time. We want to know where it's going. So if there's going to be a price, let's just set it up and create it. So what really is happening right now is an intense conversation really powered by the power industry saying, we would like to have some clarity so that there is a path forward for us to know how much reduction we have to have in our emissions. And we think that it makes sense to do that in the cheapest possible way. And one of the lowest cost ways to reduce emissions <clears throat> is to stop deforestation. So those are the mechanisms that we are now really engaged with designing. And this week, next week, a lot of action, a lot of activity and conversation about whether that can actually be put into play um, in the next, you know, before Congress actually gets out of session. Okay. Can I just ask a quick, a quick follow-up? Have yeah. you have you come up with some kind of ballpark estimate in your own mind as to what it would cost to pay, the, let's say, the three countries I mentioned, uh, you, how, mu how many billions of dollars would it cost annually to keep them from continuing to deforest? Well, what what price do you put on that? I know you have talked about a, a carbon price, but globally, what would that amount to? Well, the numbers you had were about $150 billion for uh, the Amazon. In other words, that standing stock. That standing stock is about $150 billion. Has that value. $150 yeah. billion. Now, this is why it's really important for there to be a price on it. Because if you expect public, if you expect governments to pay that, it's just not going to happen. But if you create a private sector engagement, then all of a sudden you have the private sector, which deals in trillions and trillions of dollars, looking at this as an asset, as an investment. And that's what we're trying to create. And, and so we want to create a marketplace. Yeah. So right now, we have companies who are saying, what we'd like to do is we'd like to reduce our emissions, and so we're going to cut off our emissions, or we're going to, we're going to evaluate our emissions, and we're going to figure out how much we have, and we're going to voluntarily offset with the protection of a forest someplace. So we've been doing deals like that to show that this works. And what happens when you show that works is the communities that live nearby or the families that live nearby in Brazil or in Aceh or in Papua say, we want to do that. And so what we're seeing now is a market that can emerge, and we're demonstrating it, and that's really where we have to get to. And there are many complexities. Uh, go on. The, the New York Times, we've written quite a bit about some of the issues. There, there, there are zillions. So you and then, um, and then there. Don Spiro, Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, my question was similar to Mr. Negroponte's. So I'm, what I'm understanding is when you talk about the value of carbon in this context, you're talking about the ability of the forest to absorb carbon and make that, if we set a price on carbon emissions, 
something valuable that other people will pay for. And if I'm understanding that correctly, then that element of it will be used to allow the rest of us to pollute. And so it's, it's kind of a zero sum or balanced game. And, and my second question, if I can ask too, is when you say they're protected areas and you're talking about governance, are they really safe or are they protected on a map but they're still being uh, forested, deforested? Oh, great question. Great yeah. question. The, the, I'll take the first question and you can take the second question. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, in, in terms of um, the, the carbon that is being acquired that, with the market, it's both the prevention of emissions and the absorption of emissions of CO2. So it's both. Um, and uh, in terms of giving uh, the uh, kind of permission to continue to pollute, um, this is what it's going to take. You've probably gone to some of the conversations about changing the grid and how we're going to go from oil and coal to renewables and what's the technological transfer and what's the time frame. We know that's going to take decades, right? It's going to take decades. And we know we don't have decades to wait. So what this does, this allows us to actually have the fastest, along with efficiency, this is the fastest, cheapest way to reduce the number of emissions. It cannot be seen as we're going to continue to pollute. But if you actually power, you know, make an investment in a power plant and you've got a 20-year life cycle, you're not going to shut that power plant down today. You've got a 20-year you know, life ahead of you. Yet we can't wait 20 years. And so what it allows a company to do is, until we've you know, gotten to the new fuel, we are able to actually reduce our emissions, offset our emissions in a very positive way. It cannot be seen as an opportunity to just keep on doing business as usual. Uh, in, there was one in the middle. Uh, it's the protected area. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah this is the, the protected area question is, a, is an important one. Before, I'll just make a brief comment about the carbon to give an example. Uh, Although there's no wo worldwide treaty on carbon yet, there are many bilateral agreements. And Brazil has made one with Norway. Norway uh, is, is giving a billion dollars to the Brazilian Development Bank to build uh, the so-called Amazon Fund, which is a trust fund for projects in the Amazon region related to carbon sequestration, carbon storage, and payment for environmental services of carbon and also water. So with this, so this trust fund is expecting more people to put money in, and Peru is doing a similar th thing with Germany. So these work out as small experiments on, uh, on bilateral partnerships that if they work in the short run, they may become a larger model for, for, for the country worldwide, and we do hope that that happens. But in terms of the, of the protected areas, that's a, that's a very good question, and we have a big homework to do that in that respect in Brazil. I can tell you easily that 40% of our protected areas, they still don't have enough personnel, they don't have enough technology. It's a big problem. But there are two good news there. One is that Brazil excels now in terms of monitoring of land from the space. And that immediately informs government officials about firing deforestation in given areas. And action is taken immediately. The, Minister of Environment himself goes to these spots where these things are happening and takes people to jail. So that's beginning to work. And another thing that works very much, and uh, I took part in initiatives like that in many cases, is environmental education with people that live in the areas surrounding these protected areas. In a very short amount of time, they became the best forest guards that you're going to have on Earth. They call the government, they call the police, they call scientists like ourselves just to say that something is going on within protected areas. Now, when we talk about protected areas in the Amazon, some of these protected areas there are larger than whole countries. So having guards only is not going to work. So you, you do have to have people more conscious about the importance of these things, and you also have to have spatial management. And I think Brazil is beginning to do a good job in, in this respect. Where was yeah, there and then? I'm right Jerry there. Finger from Houston. Um, I'm, look, I'm for forestation, simply for the beauty, aside from uh, you know the carbon. But look, as far as reducing carbon in the power industry, 
why don't we use natural gas instead of coal? I mean, that, it's a de minimus. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> why? Now, we can do that, and we got plenty of oil in this, I mean, plenty of coal in this country. And then the other thing, in Italy, as I understand it, two-thirds of the new cars, again, run on natural gas. I mean, the emissions from our automobiles is pretty dramatic, too. And we got plenty of gas. I've what written, about that? I've written, I've written extensively about that. Natural gas is um, a big component to getting this country a significant reduction from its power sector quickly. And it can be done very quickly. Um, of course, you have issues that are percolating in various places as extracting natural gas from certain uh, geological deposits comes with environmental problems that have not yet been worked out. But it's very clear that we have vast quantities that were not really understood few, uh, even 10 years ago, five years ago. And uh, any reasonable climate policy has to make that an important component. In fact, Tim Worth just gave a speech, a uh, Coloradan, uh, a couple of days ago, if not just yesterday, about this again. Uh, on, on, and, and the Times, too. If you kind of Google for NY Times and natural gas and climate, you'll see a bunch of things that I've written about that as well. Just to save time, I want to quickly move to the next questions uh, here, and then, and, and then Murray. Hi, <clears throat> Stuart Brand from Global Business Network. Uh, it's a question about second growth and restoration. Um, there was a report from the United Nations a few years ago, the New York Times picked up on that globally there's something like 55 times more tropical rainforest growing back as second growth than is being cut down as primary forest. And some, a lot of it's urbanization. People move to town, they're not doing subsistence agriculture anymore. What was pasture turns back to forest and so on. So in, cut, in, in terms of managing the Amazon, and I, and I guess the, you know, the Cerrado area as well, how do, what does a good manager of the Amazon do with second growth? If you could have a quick answer to that, it'd be great. We could fit in a couple more. Well, uh, um, there's a combination of things there. And I've, I, I have, in, my, uh, in the days when I was more active as an academic in my university, as I did quite a lot of work and research in the Amazon with forest restoration. And, and there's a combination of factors. I've seen both cases out there in the field. There are, there are cases that man has to intervene. You, you have to go there and plant trees. There are other cases that nature recovers it very, very fastly. And I've seen some of that in, in some of the flooded areas in the Amazon. You know that the Amazon has many flooded forests. And we still have an ongoing project. My students are doing that on how to recover an area that was very badly damaged by bauxite mining in, in the border between Pará and Amazonas. And after five years thinking on how to do it, uh, we finally figured that nature was doing it b b b before us. So it was just a matter of helping nature out here and there. Yeah. And in some cases, even monoculture of trees, even eucalyptus, can speed up forest restoration. And uh, in the process, people can also make a living out of it. As time goes by, you can cut the eucalyptus, sell it, and then the forest is coming back again. I have several papers written on that topic. I could, I'd love to send that to you for you to see how it works. So maybe we can fit in two more quick ones here, and then uh, the lady in the back there, who's been Thank very you. patient. <laughs> Sorry. I'm uh, Murray Galman. I'm an old friend of Conservation International. Uh, the I, first, I, the, our first friend. So <laughs> full, full disclosure is always a good thing. <laughs> I, I just he like actually to taught me how to, Murray Galman taught me how to pronounce my name. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to ask about uh, the creatures that live in the forest, in the tropical forest, uh, mammals, birds, and uh, other things, and Brazil, of course, including fish. And uh, they're in many cases in danger. What, it's what in Africa is called the bushmeat problem. And it exists many other places. You can look down from space and see a beautiful stretch of green, but a lot of the things that used to live there aren't there anymore. And I was wondering if you could comment on this uh, feature of uh, uh, preservation and governance uh, in the in the uh, in the in Amazonia. Has that been an issue? That's a very good question. But uh, luckily in Brazil we don't have too much of the bushmeat problem. Well, you have uh, parrot, rare parrots. Yeah. Cage That's right. There are, yeah. But now legislation and enforcement became very strict uh, in this respect. Both that and also the exportation of animals for you know people sometimes export for 
like pets or curiosities and all that has been happening for us. And even people in academia have gone to jail because of that. So uh, this, this has improved a lot in the past few years. And there's an issue with some of the, of the traditional communities. And I'll pick an example again from Central Amazon. There's a, a Quilombo community, uh, people f with origins in Africa, and they, they, they've been living there for many years, and they eat this type of turtle uh, that we call tracajás, and the, the, the baby turtle is particularly appealing to their taste. And uh, it's been very difficult to, you know, to change their ways. They've been doing that for centuries. But uh, after a lot of educational work, they finally changed because they figured that the animals were really going down. And now these turtles are coming back again. That's in the Porto Trombetas region. And now they can eat it you know, in a sustainable manner. So this type of experiences are beginning to be more, more and more common in the Amazon. But of course, here and there, there's two problems in this respect. That lesson keeps getting learned over and over again. Give nature just a little bit of a chance, and it's yeah. remarkably resilient. Yeah. So maybe I think this would be the last question over here. Uh, I'm Thank sure people will be available for a few minutes. So. Thank you very much. Laurie Garrett from the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Um, uh, John Negroponte started with this conversation about really what's the value of, of carbon. And I want to ask you about China, because uh, beyond just uh, the issue that Andrew raised about the Pacific Highway and the notion that China could log into the Amazon, what I have seen everywhere in the world is that China is creating a new kind of imperialism. And it's all about resources. And they're like the Borg. They show up, they strip <laughs> the, the space, and then they're gone. And I don't... What would it take in terms of carbon pricing, and how could we ever get an international agreement that China would sign that would actually slow the Borg? So, oh boy. Uh, so what we, did, we have seen, I've never called it the Borg, but what we have seen in all the places that we operate in over 40 countries where there have been significant resource conservation successes, that there is an aggressive resource acquisition program, and usually uh, China's there. Um, and so uh, I, and it's, it's not only Brazil and Peru, but you go into Africa, Gabon, yeah. Gabon yeah. it's, you know, wherever it is. And it's, I was in South Africa last week with Fortune on their global conference, and it was really talking, that was one of the key uh, discussions. Um, so it's not something that we do. It actually has to be something that every country does. And what you really have to get a nation to understand is that the future of their nation is going to be dependent upon how their people are cared for and how their natural resources are cared for. And so it's going to have to be a homegrown understanding that, and if you don't do that, you cannot succeed. No, no, I'm not, but no, I'm, I'm not talking about China. I'm talking about if you Rwanda, Liberia, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, these countries have to begin to say, these are our assets and we're going to manage them intelligently and wisely. And that means we're not just giving them wholesale to you. I've had conversations with the presidents of a number of countries just about this issue, where the conversation has really been you need to think about this as your most important asset, manage it as an endowment, as opposed to just cutting it down. And when you get into a conversation about the value you can get long-term from carbon, or the value you might be able to get for water shipping, think of the value that the nation of Suriname or Guyana has in terms of their huge freshwater stocks that can go right into the Caribbean where there's very little water. There's a, that, that valuation has not been understood. And so that is what we have to do because it's not gonna be barricades. It's gonna be intelligent understanding of why we have to take care of natural resources. Also, from the Chinese perspective, conversations with different ministries there, Ministry of Commerce and others, the conversation has gone, you need to make certain if you want a sustainable source of a resource that you allow that to be managed sustainably? And have you thought about experimenting with some of your client countries in developing that kind of a relationship? And so those are things that we're looking at nation by nation in terms of modeling some of those types of relationships. Because otherwise, it's gonna be a strip mine. 
By the way, and as a journalist looking at these issues, though, I keep coming across examples where it is a very tough, that is so tough, especially uh, poor African country, poor governance, corruption, the potential of corruption or money to flow to a local official or in, in Gabon, I think China influenced Gabon, I think it was Gabon, to change a, a law related to a park that was on uh, top of a very rich iron deposit to build a rail line and, you know, the, the pressures are uh, really strong and it's very challenging. You know, in Madagascar, where we worked for, for decades, uh, the former president uh, probably lost his office and was kicked out by a coup because he sold 250,000 acres of fertile agricultural land to a South Korean company. And, and there was a revolution against that, and, and he's gone. Unfortunately, the disc jockey that replaced him is really not very good. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, this has been a great conversation. Uh, you can go to conservation.org and you go to nytimes.com slash dot earth, D-O-T, E-A-R-T-H to find out a lot more. Thank you for coming by on this beautiful afternoon.